Welcome back to another episode of Costume Co. In this second of a three-part episode, we look at the costumes of Westworld Season 1. Warning, there will be major spoilers for the entire first season of Westworld. I haven't featured any artwork for a while, so in this shorter video, I thought I'd take an opportunity to show some viewer submissions from the last month. So I'll share some Game of Thrones style submissions in an upcoming Game of Thrones video. But for now, here are some non-Game of Thrones costumes. First up is this submission from viewer Aaron. He got this to me a while back, so I've been holding on to it. This multi-layer skirt is part of an Into the Woods Witch costume based upon the Meryl Streep character. So I haven't heard from Aaron recently. He told me that he was working on the bodice, so hopefully he's going to share that with us very soon. Here's another sketch from viewer Tatiana. She lives in the tropics, so I was so relieved to hear from her today that she is safe and sound uh, after her island was hit by both Irma and Maria. So we wish her the best. And you might recognize her style because she's already done a series of Game of Thrones costumes, which she has generously shared with us in the past. This interpretation of Belle's ball costume is from the live action movie, Beauty and the Beast, starring Emma Watson. And I will have more of her work in an upcoming video, an upcoming Game of Thrones video. Here's a more recent submission. This one's from viewer Clara. She's a 21 year old Spanish art student. She's currently specializing in illustration and production design. These illustrations are for a commission that she got of a costume for a live rolling, role playing event in which a vampire is disguised as a 1920s opera singer in Paris. Sounds so intriguing, Clara. And she did a great job of incorporating some of the more macabre aspects of the character into the silhouette and palette, which she did a great job of, of the Roaring Twenties. Speaking of macabre, here is an amazing submission from actor Mark Henderson. This stunning reproduction is of Gary Oldman's old Dracula costume from Bram Stoker's Dracula. Mark created the costume and for this photo shoot went full on with a powdered wig and white old man makeup and somehow he managed to incorporate his full beard into the makeup. Finally, my viewer Larissa, she's a huge Game of Thrones fan like me. She sent me these pictures of these awesome medieval historical costumes that she's handcrafted by hand. The first costume is of her daughter, Steph, and she was really excited to show me the beautiful honeycomb detail on Steph's sleeves, which looked just like Loris' shirt from Game of Thrones, she pointed out to me. The next one is of Larissa herself, pictured with her niece, Talma, whose costume she also made. And she hand embroidered all of these delicate flowers that we see here on her tunic. Finally, her son Tasha's court jester costume, it's modeled after a 1350s jester costume from the British Museum. So I'll leave all of the details of Larissa's costumes along with everyone else's in the description below. Thanks again to Aaron, Tatiana, Clara, Mark, and Larissa for sending me your submissions. And if you would like to share your costume designs or cosplay, I will leave my email address in the description below. And without further ado, let's get on to Westworld. The guests of Westworld, they're paying $40,000 a day to visit the park. So like Craig and his wife Lori, their clothes must look authentic for the character, but also for the viewers at home. However, the wardrobe team couldn't just go out and buy Old West costumes, so virtually everything had to be made from scratch. Costume designer Anne Crabtree explains. It's by virtue of necessity. You've got to think that folks were paying this much money to come to the park, they'd want their clothing to be bespoke. And at the same time, we wanted our clothes to be character specific. We actually had to dye every single piece too. You want things to look beautiful in the frame, so you have to control the color. That way on the screen, it translates to a beautiful painting, but they also had to somehow differentiate between the hosts and the guests. Crabtree says, we made the guest outfits a lot more opulent and beautiful and bespoke. They're supposed to feel superior to the hosts. So Lori's costume, it has a bit of a steampunk feel to it, I think. But my favorite is Craig's wool jacket with this beautiful contrasting piping and embroidery detail on the lapels. Just for fun, I found this awesome wool ladies riding topper, just like Lori's hat, from Golden Gate Western Wear in California. One of Crabtree's favorite costumes to put together was Marty. 
who was a guest in Westworld. Crabtree says, in episode three, we put this beautiful Bojana in a vest and cowboy hat. That was cool because it was the first time we got to put a woman in that rugged gunslinger role. And she looks so sexy. It was fun figuring out how to make the woman look just as powerful as the men. And I definitely believe that some of the women visiting the park would look at the men's outfits and say, F it, I want to be a badass too. Dolores also meets a family of guests, a couple with a young child, a little boy named Jacob. Now before I get into William, who's played by Jimmy Simpson, I want to let you know moving forward, I will be getting into major spoilery territory. So you've been warned. When William first arrives in Westworld, he's wearing a single-breasted black three-button suit with a white shirt and no tie. He's really kind of a clean slate. He is offered a wide range of bespoke clothing options by the host, everything that's been tailored to his exact measurements. And Crabtree explains, generally speaking, if you're a visitor in the park, you have a lot of money. You want to see what something is like, especially the first time around. Sometimes people want to be a down-to-earth hero, perhaps like William. The park has many layers and many realms of experience. One of the many challenges for the production team was the difficult shooting conditions. So according to Crabtree, who stated in a YouTube interview with Golden Derby, that production had to shoot in over 100 degree heat in the desert with blinding sun over at all times on a show that was so physical for the actors, knowing that they were going to be baking all day, but knowing that I would have to keep it realistic, you know, in terms of heavy suede and wool and that sort of thing. What's incredible was the actors were all game, thank God, because I think it helped them. If costuming the principal characters in multiple timelines and in extreme heat isn't enough, Crabtree had to keep story plot points to herself. She couldn't write anything down and most importantly, she couldn't share what she knew with any of her team or actor Jimmy Simpson, who like the rest of the cast was kept in the dark by production. Crabtree says, certainly never said anything to Jimmy. I had only a few photos on the wall because photos also tell secrets. So even my prep was crazy because I usually blast it all over the place for my crew to see. So I had to prep in a different way. I was taking photos of Jimmy and there was a photo of the man in black really far on the wall that I would kind of line up so I could see. I think there might have been one time toward the end before it was sort of written in a script for Jimmy Simpson that he kind of looked at the wall and looked at me and neither of us said anything. William's vest has a ticking fabric which was often the case historically speaking so there's no point in putting the good fabric in the back when the jacket will ultimately hide it. So this is a theme park, so obviously everything doesn't have to be completely historically accurate. But to me, William's jacket, it looks very modern. And I think it might be the height of the lapel roll and the buttons, which look a bit too low for the period, which Crabtree has stated in interviews is supposed to be somewhere between 1850 to 1890. Here's two examples of jackets from the late 1800s with high lapels that sit at or above the top of the vest. The slightly longer jacket on the left is from 1863 or 64 when it was popular to wear a loose fitting jacket with contrasting trousers. And the hip length jacket pictured on the right, it's from about 1867. The sack suit, which is the forerunner to our modern day suit, it was introduced in the 1860s. So here's an example of a picture of a man wearing a four button sack suit in 1893 that's from the McCord Museum in Montreal. Later styles of the sack suit, like the one seen on the right from 1892, were more close-fitting and hip-length. In a turning point for the character, William changes his shirt partway through season one. You know, I failed to notice it at first, but this is the same shirt that is worn by the man in black. This beautiful gray linen collarless shirt has a bib with pin-tuck pleats and these decorative pleats are used as a way to gather a large amount of fabric without using darts or seams. So pin tuck pleats are sewn in narrow channels and then they're pressed flat, usually in the opposite direction of the center front buttons. And the shirt, it's buttoned just to the bottom of the bib. Since the characters Logan and William were not established in the pilot, their look is completely the work of Anne Crabtree. Of this she says, 
We had quite a lot of fun with them. We did black on Ben and white on Jimmy. They are compadres. I was lucky enough to meet them on the same day and got to create their characters separately and together, which is quite rare in TV scheduling. Jimmy had a slightly more modern Western hat, not quite the hero, but with this optimistic upturned brim and a bit naive too. So there's a lot of layers in their choice of hat. And here's a good look at William's cowboy hat. Crabtree says, in any gentleman's story, the hat is one of the most important parts of the gentleman's wardrobe, and that carries over in the West. You know, it looks very similar to this Smith-built cattleman's hat that I found online. In actuality, multiples of William's white cowboy style hat were purchased at the Country General Store in California. Like his change of shirt, I noticed that as time moves along, William's hat looks less white, although, you know, it could be the lighting. So let me know what you think in the comment section below. His pants are high-waisted in this sort of striped ticking fabric, a tightly woven cotton or linen fabric that's often used for mattresses and pillows. And it's the same fabric that's used at the back of his vest. At this time in history, pants sat just above her natural waistline and not at or below the belly button like we see in modern fashion and it looks like they've been dyed this sort of tawny color. William's leather belt holds his holster and bullets and sits on his hip, but isn't actually used to keep his pants up. That's what his suspenders are for. The button suspenders are woven and attached to his pants with leather suspender tabs. So to clarify, the term suspender is an American term, but we also do use it in Canada, while braces is more of a British European style term. And you might refer to elastic suspenders with clips as suspenders, like our modern day versions, but you'll find that most Yanks will likely say button suspenders to clarify the difference. So if you say braces in North America, most people are going to think that you're speaking about teeth braces. In the season one finale, William returns to Sweetwater to discover that Dolores doesn't know him. His transformation to the dark side is nearly complete, as you might say. He's now wearing almost the same costume as the man in black. A black vest, pants, holster, leather gloves, but most importantly, his iconic black hat. So while William is light at the beginning, Logan's outfit is dark. Like William, Logan is wearing a series of separates, but all in versions of black, with the exception of his tie and pocket hanky. His black wool frock coat and pockets are bound with grosgrain ribbon trim. And we know that Logan's coat is a frock coat because of the slightly longer, just above the knee length, and that it only buttons down to the waist seam. Sack coats like William's don't have a waist seam. Logan's vest is single-breasted with a narrow shawl collar, and we get a peek at a pocket watch. Here are a few examples of similar coats from this era, both from 1860. This coat is made from wool and it's trimmed with silk braid trim. The top notch collar is velvet. Notice the waist seam and the two buttons at the back vent, another attribute of a frock coat. You'll also see this on cutaway and tail coats. This silk velvet coat is either American or European and is also bound with trim. Both of these coats can be found on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Logan wears a white finely striped shirt with an attached white wing collar. This is the type of collar you'll see in contemporary formal wear. Like William, his vest is backed with a lining fabric and adjustable with a tab and buckle. Here are a few examples of single breasted waistcoats from the period. This American silk waistcoat is from 1860. It also has a shawl collar, and as you'll notice, it has the little buckle at the center back that can adjust the waist. This American or European silk and cotton waistcoat is dated between 1840 to 1859. Both waistcoats are on display at the Met. Logan's black hat is called a telescope hat because the round crown has an appearance of a telescope. Crabtree says, Ben's character comes from money and he is dangerous, sexy, and in the know, so his hats had more of a moneyed European flair and came from research books and photographs. It's the hardest decision, I tell you. It takes as long to decide on what hat style because it's the first thing people see in these wide, expansive shots, so it means so much. 
Actor Clark Gable made this hat famous in his portrayal of Rhett Butler in Gone with the Wind. The Knutson Hat Company in California carries a similar gambler style telescope hat. Unlike your typical cowboy hat, the rounded edges are bound with ribbon. Logan's silk cravat is tied into a square knot and worn under his wing collar. Here are two examples of American silk cravats from 1900. Like the modern tie, the cravat is often tapered in the center to ease with bulk. In this scene, Logan is dressed as a confederado, which is a group of ex-confederate soldiers who now work as mercenaries on the outskirts of the park. Logan's coat has been stripped of any rank or insignia. His uniform looks similar to George Hamilton's confederado costume in the western A Time for Killing from 1967. On the left is a picture of an unidentified confederate captain from North Carolina and on the right is a reproduction of a Confederate officer's frock coat from the regimental quartermaster that looks similar to Logan's. The coat can either be worn closed, like how we see it here, or buttoned back, like how Logan wears it. Here's a pretty good reproduction of what I think looks like Logan's Civil War waistcoat. Some of you might be wondering about Logan's pin. There was some chatter in Reddit that it looks a lot like the Hand of the King pin from Game of Thrones. And while it does look like an abstract hand, I couldn't find anything online that proves this. And as far as I could tell from my research, this is not a Civil War Confederate pin. So let me know what you think it might be in the comments section below. The Man in Black is portrayed by American actor Ed Harris. In a hidden remote interview back in 2016, before the season finale aired, where Anne Crabtree couldn't give any plot details away, she said, So the Man in Black, he's just tainted evil. I had many theories, but I think the Man in Black is written and drawn a certain way, and he goes for Black because he was a good guy in his outside life. It's all psychological, too. Why would you choose to be a Black hat? Maybe in my outside life, I'm good, and this is my chance to be evil and make decisions I wouldn't usually make in my real life. There's no doubt that The Man in Black is an homage to The Gunslinger from 1973's Westworld. Yul Brynner's The Gunslinger is pictured on the left, is based on Chris Adams, who is Brynner's character from The Magnificent Seven. You'll notice that the two characters' costumes are nearly identical. And in turn, the Chris Adams character from The Magnificent Seven is based upon the Kambe, and I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, uh, he's based on Kambe from Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. So as a girl growing up in Kentucky, but whose mother is Okinawan Japanese, Anne Crabtree's admiration of Yul Brynner's work in Westworld was partly because she had never seen anyone Asian on TV before. So this powerful memory clearly has informed her work on Westworld's chief antagonist, the Man in Black. Now just to clarify though, Brynner is actually Russian born, but he does have partial Northern Mongol heritage. As I mentioned earlier, young William's costume is an earlier version of old William with just a few small changes. Certainly the vest is the same. It has the same uh, very indistinctive stripe. His belt and holster and black leather gloves also look the same. Trish Somerville, the costume designer for the pilot episode of Westworld, said in an interview, with the gunslingers and the cowboys that we aged a lot. Ed Harris's costume we left because he's a newcomer just visiting the park. Anyone that was visiting the park, we did slightly less aging, and anyone that was a host in the park, we did more aging. The man in black shirt is collarless, like the one that William wears, so he's wearing a sort of cravat, but knotted like a tie. Here's an example of a cravat style tie from the Met. This American silk tie dates from 1895 to 1905. Of the Man in Black's jacket, Crabtree says, there's a very old school hippie weaver in upstate New York near Woodstock who wove the fabric for this jacket. We had another artisan hand paint it afterward. A Reddit poster tipped me off to the source of the fabric. Thistle Hill Weavers, which is a bespoke custom and commission weaving mill. It's actually there in upstate New York. And here's a close-up shot of the jacket fabric on the left, a double cloth with chenille in the warp. And a fun fact is that that hippie that Crabtree refers to is actually Rabbit Goody. She's a former high school classmate of actor Ed Harris. 
Goody stated on Facebook about Ed Harris, I think I might have helped radicalize him in the 60s. I would like to think so anyhow. The Man in Black's hat is a diamond or pinch front cowboy hat. It's a very classic Western construct looking at the Wild West who have white hats and black hats, Crabtree says. It's also something that exists in Westerns from the beginning of time until the present. And the Man in Black and Hector are both black hats. Black hats are more dastardly and they may be up to evil or uber sexy or both. The Man in Black's hat was custom made by Hollywood hat maker Baron's Hats and originally crafted in 100% rabbit felt by master hatter Mark Magea. Baron's Hats also made William's season one finale hat. In this picture, the Man in Black is wearing a Union Prussian blue cavalry coat, a uniform worn during the American Civil War. Teddy wears a shorter version of the cavalry coat, which were more practical for riding. Cavalry trousers were sky blue with tin buttons like the one seen here on Teddy and the Man in Black. Non-commissioned officer cavalry had a yellow stripe down the leg. The Man in Black's belt buckle seen on the left looks a lot like this Union Civil War Eagle brass and nickel belt buckle seen on the right. I found this one online. And it's possible the production used authentic buckles because these appear to be readily available from collectors. However, they could have also uh, purchased uh, really good quality reproductions. You can't get a close-up look at the brass buttons on his coat, but it's likely they're like this Civil War era button with an eagle motif. Here's an enlisted man's frock coat, similar to the one worn by the man in black. It's made of 21 ounce wool kersey, which is a very dense wool used for military coats. And that completes part two in my three-part episode on the costumes of Westworld. In part three, I examine the costumes of the hosts, including Dolores and Maeve. So I hope to have that up early next week. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell notification so you don't miss a thing. And if you find value in my videos, consider supporting me on Patreon. As always, thank you so much for watching.